Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. John DeLynn. It is May 3rd, 2018, and I am so very excited uh, to have you with us today. We're broadcasting live from our Mormon Stories studios in Salt Lake City, Utah, and we are going to be covering a very important topic today. Uh, the topic is how uh, Mormon bishops handle uh, ward members who report abuse. And to uh, share in the story today, we have a really unique set of two interviewees. We have Jen and we have Todd. Uh, Jen, throughout her life, uh, at least uh, on two or three occasions, has been a victim of abuse uh, within a Mormon context. And then Todd is her former bishop. Uh, and uh, Jen is going to be talking to us about Number one, uh, you know, uh, her abuse experiences and what it was like to work uh, with Todd as her bishop and kind of the things that he did right and maybe the things he didn't do right. We can get into that. And she's also going to talk about other, you know, experiences with at least one or two other bishops and how they handled uh, the abuse. And the goal of this interview <clears throat> is to help us all learn more about abuse, about how to help uh, victims of abuse better, and to help uh, bishops and other people in authority or power, including, uh, uh, you know, other members of the ward, other leaders within kind of a stake setting. The idea is to help people in the LDS Church, outside the LDS Church, and other churches, just to help us all learn about how to deal more effectively with abuse. So we're really excited for that today. I do have a few announcements uh, that I'll uh, just shout out, just to kind of get them out of the way, and we use these to help pay the bills. Uh, we want to give your attention to the new mormonstories.org website. We've done a redesign of that website, and we just want to make sure everyone takes a chance to check it out. One of the most important things about our redesign, uh, and a shout out to Jerry Cargill, who did the redesign for us. If you go to the homepage, you'll find a big list of lists that you can check out. So, for example, we have the top 25 most important episodes. Uh, we have top 10 LGBT-themed episodes. We have top 10 episodes related to women, to minorities and people of color. We have top 25 episodes for faithful Mormons. And the idea is there's now such a massive library of podcasts on Mormon stories. We want to make it very easy for someone coming to Mormon stories for the first time or someone who's relatively new to jump to the episodes that are most relevant or interesting to them. We have stuff on navigating mixed orientation marriages, navigating marriages in general, uh, uh, on being transgender within a Mormon context. Uh, we have episodes on truth claims, on historicity, uh, exit narratives, all that stuff. And we just want to make sure that you know about that great redesign. Another important part of that is that we have a newsletter that we send out once a month. Some of you don't hear about our events or you don't hear about special events or you want to kind of keep in the loop on what's going on within Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation. And you are able to sign up for that newsletter if you go to mormonstories.org. There's a little bar at the top. You can type in your name and email address. And we just wanted to give you a shout out. We, uh, we release these newsletters monthly. The final thing we want to call your attention to are the <coughs> events uh, that are coming up. These are really important events. These events are have been held for several years now. They're workshops and retreats. They're focused on helping people navigate a faith crisis, helping people rebuild a life after a faith crisis in or out of the church. Uh, they're on healthy relationships, uh, communicating with believing family and friends, dealing with a mixed faith marriage, dealing with healthy uh, you know marriages in general. Uh, and then even mental health and how to have positive mental health during and after a Mormon transition. These events are consistently rated 4.9 out of 5.0 by the people who attend. And so many people have told us that these events have saved their marriages, uh, helped save their mental health, even in some cases helped save their life. And um, they've been an important part of building community uh, within people's local areas. And so we have events coming up. Well, we have Angela Sof coming to Salt Lake City May 17th, and she's a, a really exceptional singer-songwriter who's written an album about her faith crisis. We're really lucky to have her come 
and perform some of her songs and talk about those songs May 17th. Please come to that if you're in the area. We're coming to Boise, Idaho, May 18th and 19th. We would really love to have uh, that event happen. That evening, separate from the workshop, we're having a, a social where um, people who aren't part of the workshop can still come and karaoke and have fun and, and get to meet everybody and talk. So uh, Boise, May 18th to 19th, including the social. We're doing a retreat in Park City, June 8th through 10th. Uh, that's going to be longer. So the difference between workshops and retreats, workshops are about a day and a half. Um, we cover the same sorts of topics, but maybe not in quite the depth that we do in the retreats. So the June 8th through 10th uh, retreat is two and a half days. We'll be able to get more into your personal experiences, uh, more personal attention to what you care about, and cover more topics. Uh, Natasha Helfer-Parker and Margie Delin will be joining us for the retreat on June 8th through 10th. So we would love to have you come if you want to. Again, it's in Park City. We have discounted lodging for those who are interested. And we also have some scholarships that are available. So if you want to be a recipient, if you can't afford uh, the, the registration fees, we have scholarships available. You can email staff at openstoriesfoundation.org to request a scholarship. It'll be a discount or a free entrance, depending on your situation. If you've experienced good things from these workshops and retreats and you want to give back, you can also email staff at openstoriesfoundation.org and, and we'll give you information on how to actually donate um, to the scholarship fund to let others attend these workshops and retreats. And in that way, you can help save a marriage, help save a life, help someone who's struggling. Um, you can go to these events and see the agendas now. So go to uh, the Boise event or the Mormon Stories uh, Retreat in Park City, and you can actually see the agenda. We're coming to Houston July 13th through 15th. We're really excited to be visiting Texas. And then we're doing Idaho Falls August 10th through 11th. And then finally, again, our Bahamas cruise, we're going to have a blast October 24th through 28th. And that's going to be more just about having fun and getting, getting to know each other. It's less about uh, sort of coaching and, and um, you know, heavier work. So those are the events. Uh, please check us out again at mormonstories.org slash events. We would love to have you join us. All right. So without any further ado, we are here to talk about Mormon bishops and the handling of abuse. And uh, Jen and Todd, we want to welcome you both to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for, yeah, having, thanks us. for having us. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that anytime we discuss abuse, it can be triggering for some people. So we just want to acknowledge that. We want to let you know that we probably won't be going into extreme depth in, in this podcast, but we will be going into some depth about uh, the abuse that Jen experienced. And so we just want to make sure you practice self-care um, and do whatever you need to do. Pause, come back, take this in chunks, avoid the interview, whatever you need to do to manage your um, mental and physical health. Um, we just want to let you know that, that that's uh, part of this process. So, um, so thank you for coming on to talk about uh, something so hard. Are there any disclaimers that either of you want to offer before we jump into the, the topics? Anything that I've forgotten to mention? Not that I can think of. No, I, the trigger warning for abuse, I think that's good enough. Okay. So why don't we begin, uh, as we always do, just giving a little bit of your respective Mormon backgrounds. Is that all right? Sure. Okay. So um, Jen, let's start with you. Just let's spend a couple minutes on your upbringing prior to the abuse, unless the abuse started immediately, <laughs> and then we can talk about that too. Um, well, well, so I was born and raised in the church. I have three younger brothers and one younger sister. Um, grew up pretty, I was really close to all of my siblings. My mom really focused on that. We did all the Mormon things early morning scripture study and family home evening. My parents were both in Cub Scouts and Scouts and so just actively involved in the outdoors. I So that was kind of basics. Um, were you raised in Utah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And how many siblings? So there's five of us total. Okay. So. Okay. All right. Um, Todd, how about you? Do you want to tell us a little bit about your Mormon upbringing? Yeah, um, I'm born and raised in Utah. My uh, 
um, ancestors joined the church in England and, and immigrated to Nauvoo. And I came out to Salt Lake and settled in Utah as they were signed by Brigham Young. And so I've been an active member of the church 50 plus years of my life. Um, served in various callings from, um, well, obviously bishop, but before that on the high council and elders quorum president, scoutmaster. Um, anything they asked me to do, I faithfully accepted the calling and fulfilled it. And maybe talk about uh, kind of how you became bishop and what, what happened there. Um, when I became bishop, I was serving on the high council, um, and it was, a, it was a student ward for married students. So to qualify to attend the ward, um, you first had to be a student somewhere, and that could be an online course or attending BYU or the local university. Um, and I was on the high council, and it was usually from the high council that the bishops were called. Um, so I was called after sitting on the high council for uh, three or four years. And I was called to be the bishop of one of the wards that I was working with. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Well, um, I guess that takes us <laughs> to your experiences with abuse. And I just want to say thank you so much for being willing to talk about something that I'm sure isn't very fun to talk about. It's not very fun, but it's pretty important. So um, for me, abuse is kind of my whole life. I was abused um, sexually by family members when I was um, starting when I was about five. Um, and then from there, I was assaulted while I was a student at BYU and um, then got married and dealt <coughs> with marital rape, though I didn't know what that was yet, and also physical and emotional abuse while being married. So I have a whole lifetime of abuse stories. Um, that I don't think are important to tell all of them, but um, so I don't know quite where. Yeah, sure. Well, let's <laughs> let's start with your. When did you first start interacting with bishops about the abuse? Um, you know, thinking about it, I didn't go to bishops for abuse necessarily um, till I was at BYU. But I started interacting with bishops as young as 12 because I was suicidal and struggling with depression. And um, by the time I was 14, I had a pretty serious eating disorder. And so I was interacting with bishops and sometimes abuse situations would come up, but they didn't really know how to handle it. The first time it really, um, that I, I was pushed to go talk to a bishop was a student at BYU, I was assaulted. And one of my good friends said... Can, can I pause for just one yeah. second? So you mentioned things you struggle with in your early teen years. Yeah. Do you associate those with the abuse that you yes. experienced? Yes. Talk about um, what, what, it, what it's like to experience abuse and then how those things naturally flow from it. Can you kind of talk about yeah. how the, the impact of abuse in the life of a, of a teenage girl, Mormon teenage girl, and how it manifests in some of these things. So, and whatever you need to tell us about that early abuse that would help us understand how it affected you. Well, for me, I'd say the early abuse, I mean, and this sounds strange to say, but the abuse didn't affect me so much. It wasn't until I got to church and started hearing about um, chastity lessons and chewed pieces of gum and licked cupcakes and all the things that that we hear in Mormonism about being pure and clean, and I knew I wasn't. So with that, like a deep belief that I was disgusting and horrible, and I couldn't even at the time nail it down. Like I couldn't tell you why I believed I was disgusting. I just knew I was when I listened to these messages. And I couldn't tell you why I hated myself. I just, there was, I hated myself. And with the eating disorder, the hatred of my body, I mean, that one I can link pretty closely to as I matured and became more of an adult with a ad more adult body, I didn't want that. And um, eating disorder, starving myself, prevented, I mean, all the things that make, you don't get boobs and you don't get all the things that make a womanly body. And that was a very, that felt safe. And there also, I discovered 
but by, I mean, eating disorders are an addiction. So by not eating, I felt not as depressed and not as anxious and all of the background noise that came from the abuse that I'd never dealt with kind of subsided, if that makes sense. So for you, the eating disorder was a way to self-medicate from mm -hmm. the pain and distress you were experiencing from being a victim of abuse. Mm -hmm. How does how does participating in, in eating disordered behaviors act as a form of self-medication? It's awfully hard to think clearly if you're starving. I mean, it's awfully hard to feel much when, I mean, think of the days when you're fasting and you, all you can think about is food. Everything else goes away. It's kind of like that. So, and with Mormonism too, there's the power of fasting and I'm going to show that I'm more powerful. My spirit is stronger than my body by, I don't need food kind of ideas were very, played a big part for me. I don't know, does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, I think when I was uh, working with clients who cut, mm -hmm. I never understood why someone would take a razor blade or a knife and, and actually cut. And then, and then I realized that they do this as a way to numb the mm -hmm. mental and emotional distress that they're experiencing. So they'd rather have the pain it's, of the cutting mm -hmm. than they would the emotional distress of what they've been through. And it sounds like having an eating disorder makes you so hungry that it can drown out the, the rumination and the emotional distress. Mm -hmm. And you do feel like the church's messages around purity and worthiness, uh, sexual purity, were kind of at the core of your self-loathing. Is that I right? I think so. I mean, it's hard to say being that I was abused so young and Mormonism was so important to me, but it's possible that without Mormonism's teachings on chastity and purity, I still would have gotten to that same self-loathing place. But for me, it's so central. I can't, I don't know, but because Mormonism was so much a part of me that it is a part of that self-loathing. Got it. Okay. So, um, as this develops in your teen years, mm -hmm. does your bishop, you know, your bishop growing up, does he know you have an eating disorder? Does mm -hmm. he know? Did you tell him about the abuse? Did you tell your bishops about the um, abuse as a teen? Some, yeah. Um, and looking back, I'd say they just didn't know how to deal with it. So it was kind of like the talking about the importance of forgiveness, importance of family and, and kind of, and I have a habit of glossing over. I mean, so even talking about abuse, I might've mentioned it, but I quickly moved past it and talked about how I'm crazy and I'm disgusting and I need to repent. And because it was so internalized, even that young. So so when you're, when you're a Mormon teenage girl as a victim of abuse and you're going to church every Sunday and you're learning about how everyone's supposed to be righteous and eternal families, um, I, I'm a, are you comfortable saying whether, let's just say, the abuser in your teen years was a family member? Mm-hmm. Yes, it was. Okay. What's that like to be a Mormon girl hearing the plan of salvation, hearing about the gospel, and to have it being an actual family member that's abusing you? What is that? How does that square uh, with that... how you see the, yourself and how you see the gospel? <clears throat> so, I mean, the gospel is always right. The eternal family is so important. So the fact that I'm not okay with this eternal family and that I'm upset and I'm angry and I'm hurting, I'm the problem. There's something wrong with me. And so it's not, I mean, so that's where it's, it's like, it's, there's nothing wrong with the abuser even, or the church, of course, it's all me. So if I just repent or try hard enough and I'm good enough, then I can 
then I'll be okay with the way things are and I'll be happy with this eternal family. And it doesn't make sense as I say it because it sounds so crazy, but that's really how I made it fit. What keeps, and for some this is going to be an obvious or even an outrageous question, what keeps a young, what was it, 13, 12? What keeps a young Mormon girl from just telling everybody, I've been abused, they're abusing me, fix this, help? Or is that what you did? Um, I didn't, no. Um, what, you would think that's what you do. You'd tell your mom, you'd tell your dad, whoever. You would tell the non-abuser, your siblings, the bishop, everyone. Your, and then the, the bad person would get in trouble and they'd be put in jail and then the abuse would be gone. What keeps that from happening? Um, with family, I mean, it's family. I, I, I loved these people they, and I wanted... I wanted to protect them and I didn't want to hurt them. And even sitting here now, like I don't want to hurt anybody and I don't want anybody to, I mean, they had their own crap that they had to go through, which made them who they were. So it's, it's like, so I did want to protect them. The other part is that it wasn't their fault. It was mine. That, and one of the things, I mean, victim blaming, we talk about it all the time as something else, but victim blaming, it's easy to take responsibility because then you have control. If it's all my fault, then I can stop it from happening. I can, it's, I have total control over it if I'm just better, good or nice or whatever. I mean, and so by the time I was, I was pretty little and it was all my fault. So why would I tell somebody about it? Because it's all my fault. So. If someone's hurting you, how, as a, as a teenage girl, do you translate that into it being your fault? I mean, you, if you, let's just say you had a sibling that punched you, you'd know, well, he punched me. That's bad. It's your fault. You'd cry, you'd get mad, you'd tell your parents, right? What is it about abuse that made it so that you, it wasn't very clear to you that it wasn't your fault, it was theirs? Do you even have a way to describe that? Or is it, is it the power differential? Maybe it's, I don't know, I'm honestly. Really young. Yeah, and I, I mean, like I said, started when I was pretty young. So it's kind of, the foundation my life was built upon is kind of abuse. So with that being my foundation, no, I didn't look at my brother hit me, so I'm mad. It was my brother hit me. I shouldn't be mad. I should be calm. And I, it's, and I, the fact that I'm mad shows that there's something wrong with me. Like it was really mm. a mess. Okay. <laughs> and did the abuser ever sort of have a communication with you about the abuse where they would communicate to you as your fault or? Not that I can remember. Okay. So it wasn't something that was discussed with the abuser. Like this is because of you. I'm hurting you because you're bad. This is just something that you... Yeah, possibly, but not that I can remember. Okay. Okay. So by the time you're a young teen, you're internalizing all of this. It's your fault. You develop self-loathing and an eating disorder. And so how does that progress through high school before you get to BYU? Uh, at high school, I was known as the anorexic one. Um, like people would say that? Oh, or? yeah. Then, I mean, I, I, and I kind of took that, went with that identity. I was comfortable with it. Um, for me, I mean, the self-loathing and the hatred and the fear that I lived with all the time, it just, I don't know, it just made sense to me to be, to fall into that one little niche where I could be both seen and invisible. Um, eventually I was hospitalized. I, um, in high school, mm -hmm. just did that. I actually missed my high school graduation because I was in an inpatient facility. So, and, um, I was forced to go and then it ended up staying longer than I was forced to stay because I realized I could get some help for both me and, um, my immediate family kind of learning how to communicate with each other and talk to each other and deal with stuff. I wasn't ready at that point to deal with any kind of sexual abuse, so I didn't. Um, I just couldn't, I wasn't ready to talk about it. So it, 
wasn't there in my memory to talk about while I was there, but could talk about family dynamics and things that I needed help with and learn to eat my dinner. <laughs> right. Did your bishop try and help you with your eating disorder at all? He did. Um, he... What was effective versus not effective? Uh, effective, he actually um, helped my parents pay for it, pay for, um, for me to stay longer. Insurance would have covered two weeks. I ended up staying almost five months, and the bishop got money from the church to help pay for it. Um, not effective, telling me to eat, um, telling me it was a sin I needed to repent for, the starving myself, um, telling me I was being selfish, because those things just... I already, I, it's, they just fed into the self-loathing, so it didn't help. But, but he did get help. I mean, church paid for an inpatient facility, so that was, I, my parents couldn't have paid for the stay I had. Do you feel like that stay, that residential treatment saved your life, possibly? Yes. So in some sense, the church saved your life. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yes. <laughs> yeah. They, I mean, and where I was at was very LDS. So we, so a big focus of my treatment was coming back to, um, my spirituality, my going back to church and, and finding a love for God and being a good Mormon girl. That was a big part of my treatment. Um, but definitely taking where I was headed, I wouldn't have lived much longer I just either because my body wouldn't have been able to handle it or suicide I would have been done I wouldn't have made it and how did you get better at that point in your life if, if somebody let's say we have a listener who's struggling with an eating disorder other than residential treatment what were the components of residential treatment or just of you getting better that were most effective um If you can, I mean, finding a group of, of people who are recovery focused, that was really helpful. Other people that were recovery focused, um, a good therapist and a good dietitian. Um, at that point, what I call recovery then and what I call recovery now is very different, but recovery then was just, you just eat your food. Um, if I, I mean, figured out that learning boundary, healthy boundaries and all the things that I've learned in the last 20 something years since then, I, those are important, but I, so I just trying to think of what to do, get help. And if you think you're not sick enough to need help, that's a sure sign you are sick and you need help. Okay. <laughs> And when you say find a good therapist, how do you know if you found a good one? Um, find somebody who specializes in eating disorders and who you feel comfortable with. I mean, that's, it's okay to fire a therapist. It's okay to say, this isn't working and leave and find somebody else. And it's a process that sucks if you, you don't find that right away. But if you're not comfortable, don't stay. But so there's my... Okay. So you missed your high school graduation, but you made it out of high school alive. I did. Thanks in part to the church. Mm -hmm. The parts about you being selfish probably weren't healthy or repenting, but, but, but the other parts were. Right. And I think, I mean, like I said, he's doing the best he could. He was trying to be helpful, but so I'm glad that he was willing to help find funding because there's no way my parents could have taken care of it and there was no way I could have paid for such a thing. Yeah. So. We're often hard on the LDS church in this podcast because we're trying to explore ways the church can harm people sometimes and to give us suggestions on how to do better. But we have to acknowledge when the church does good and when the church pays for effective treatment, uh, that's an amazing positive thing. It's The treatment isn't always effective, especially when it's LDS family services and they're not effective, but sometimes it is. So. We'll give credit when credit is due. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna um, 
I'm going to just read a few comments. Uh, Rick says he's in tears at your story. Uh, Paul says, Jen and Todd, we love you guys. Karen says, uh, sending much love to Jen. Thank you for sharing your story. Rachel says, you're so brave, Jen. Thank you for sharing. Um, Zan, hi, Zan. Uh, Zan says, Jen, you are so strong and powerful. Um, Kevin says, this is heartbreaking, not an easy one to listen to. So shout out to everyone who's weathering the difficulty of the story and sending their support uh, to Jen. Um, also a comment from Tom. Tom says, the story is so sad. One major problem is the guilt the church puts on people that makes you feel that things happening to you are because of your lack of faith and lack of obedience to the commandments, and it's your fault. The church needs to reach out to members to help them deal with these situations and offer professional legal help and stop making people feel that they can stop this by faith, hope, and prayer. Any comments? Thanks, Todd. Any comments for Todd? Um, exactly. That kind of like I'd said that I went to bishops and I rarely talked about abuse, but I did talk about like self-loathing and all those things. And the way they took that was, well, then you need to repent because I mean, that makes sense. So then it just piled it on more. So I, exactly. Right. I'm just going with exactly. Um, uh, Todd brings up the point that the church pays for the damages it causes. Is it fair to blame the church for the damages? Um, Certainly not all. Not all of it. Yeah. Uh, kind of the way I, I describe it is, you know, a founda my foundation was built first on abuse, then the Mormon church, and then the, everything else. So, I mean, without the abuse, and if it was just the Mormon church as the foundation, it'd be different. But with abuse, first and foremost, that takes, it's like now everything in Mormonism goes through the abuse lens. Like the lens of I've been used and abused and and all the things that happen in your mind when you're abused. So all the teachings now go through that lens. So I don't think it's 100% their fault, but they didn't. The te a lot of the teachings didn't help. Right. So uh, thanks to everyone for um, their comments. That was Jeff who made that comment. Okay. So you so you go to BYU. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And um, is that when you first started talking to your bishops more about the actual abuse? Um, I was actually assaulted on a date. Um, Sex sexually assaulted? Sexually physically? assaulted. Okay. Sexually. Can you talk about that in terms of like, how does that happen? So you're, were you a freshman? Uh-huh. I talk was out on a date okay. with my home teacher. Um, and we pulled up in front of the temple. And um, it was a bucket seat in the front. And he moved over to kind of start kissing me. And because of my past abuse, I dissociated, which is, and still to this day, from my experience of that, what happened, I'm sitting on the dashboard watching my body. It was an out-of-a-body experience. So let's talk about that. So okay. talk about how disassociation happened as a, child and teenager I and what it is because people don't know what it is I know people don't know what it is so yeah. I mean so you're being abused and then how does that go from being abused to disassociating what happens emotionally or cognitively if you can describe it um I can tell you what it's like as just as an experience um I mean really it's trauma makes us we do whatever we can to survive when we're in a traumatic situation because it's so painful it's it's either so physically painful, emotionally painful, or violent, whatever. Well, yeah, whatever it is. And one of the ways our brain copes is to check out. So for me, my experience was it's an out of body experience. My perspective is I'm sitting on the dashboard watching him um, touch me and all the things that he was doing to me. I'm watching it happen completely out. My body's frozen and I can't control it is the way it happens for me. And a lot of people, it's more just a fro frozen feeling that they don't have control over their body because they're just kind of out of it. Others, it's you can pass out. You can faint as part of dissociation. Um, that has happened to me where it's you get overwhelmed, so you pass out. Um, 
And if somebody's being a jerk and they're saying, I, I don't, you know, how can it be that you're watching this happen and you don't stop it, right? What would you say, like, what you're experiencing when it happens? I'm a, byst- a complete bystander with no body to stop it happen. Without a will? Are you thinking stops? Are you watching it saying stop, stop? Or are you just like... Yeah, I'd st- I mean, it's stop it. And for me, it was... Um, I remember the thought of who am I to say no? He's the priesthood holder and I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing. Um, so I remember that thought. And of course I want it to stop. And how do I make him stop? And there's nothing I can do. Um, but it's like a dream almost. Yeah. But also, I mean, just to understand, because I didn't realize that other men didn't like get off on these things. I'm sitting there completely rigid, frozen, and shaking. So any man that doesn't, that's not a normal, like, most men don't enjoy, I don't think that, and would get a pretty clear message. I'm not there with them. So that was the, I mean, so it's like, so I'm, I can't stop it. I'm, my body is there rigid and almost like a seizure, shaking. But I can, from my perspective, I'm completely outside of my body. And is this, like, as you think back, is this someone who would have given you signs that they were an abuser in this way? Were they super nice? Were they? Yeah, he was super nice. He was my home teacher. And um, I think he was the Elders Quorum president. He was definitely in the Elders Quorum presidency of the little student ward we lived in. He lived down the hall. He came over all the time. Seemed like a nice guy. So there are no signs. There wasn't creepy vibes or anything like that. No. Um, you know, and my creepy vibe might not have been working effectively because of all of my life experience. I'll, so maybe other people thought he was creepy. I didn't. Right. I thought he was a nice guy. And then we have to sort of call out patriarchy. There, it, I would have to think that this underpinning infrastructure of men being in power and women having this sort of specific role would lend to a a feeling of powerlessness as a victim. Do you want to talk about possibly the role of patriarchy in how, as a BYU student, you might experience? Well, I, I remember the thought, who am I to say no? I'm a nothing, I'm a nobody. And at this point, although I've been through eating disorder treatment, I'm still really struggling So I'm not doing all the things I'm supposed to do right. I sometimes sleep in instead of going to church and miss some of my meetings. And I remember all of those things. So, and he's an elders quorum president, so he's good. So it's like, who am I to say no? And what right do I have in any, so again, it sounds so weird to say now, but that's how it felt then. Yeah. Um, and if somebody were to say, but you knew the law of chastity, you knew that it's bad to be involved in any sexual activity. So even if you don't have a lot of self-worth, you can be like, oh, well, this is bad things we're doing, right? Uh, Even if he's, even if the church has sent you messages that you're not worthy, and even if he is a male and thus privileged with more power, Mm -hmm. that, that didn't feel... Well, and too, like I said, I was completely there. I had no, I mean, I was You're you're disassociated. Yeah, yeah. I'm gone. Right. So, um, and I left the experience, I mean, because of law of chastity, I left the experience believing it was my fault and I should have done something better and I should have done something right. And that is... um, Like you shouldn't have been in their car with them at all. Right. Like I should have known that was coming. I should have said something, I should have done something, I should have, and I don't know, I mean, it's like, I couldn't have told you even what I should have done at where, what point. Because it's not super logical even, right? No. It's super emotional. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so you left a sexual assault, do you call it rape or sexual assault? What do you call it? Sexual assault, it was not okay. all the way to rape. <clears throat> so you would leave a sexual assault experience feeling like it was at least part your fault? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, which is how a friend prompted me, pushed me, cajoled me, held my hand, and we went to the bishop and 
um, told him what happened. And I, he told me it wasn't my fault, which I think for a BYU bishop is pretty dang impressive because he did get that part. It's not your fault. He didn't do anything wrong. Um, you couldn't have stopped it, especially anyone. So he understood me telling him that it's like I was frozen and I couldn't. Did you go to repent? How did the meeting happen? Um, my friend sat, said, I think it was trying to deal with I was an emotional wreck. So my friend was like, we are going. And I don't just because you go to bishops. That's who you go to when you're, I mean, especially an 18 year old kid at a BYU ward. Like, it's just. Who else would you go to? And I'll just say a little, I'll do these little timeouts. If you're a BYU student uh, or a college student, go to the counseling center at your university, even at BYU and maybe even especially at BYU. Those counselors are very well trained in dealing with sexual assault and rape, uh, generally for the most part. I know several counselors at BYU Provo and they're phenomenal. So they're better probably than a bishop, right? Yes, I would. Uh -huh. Me now would definitely agree with that and say, go, the bishop doesn't know what he's, don't go to the, you can go to your bishop as extra help and whatever, but that's not the place to go to. Right. Okay. So you go to the bishop, your friend drags you to the bishop uh -huh. and you say what to the bishop? Um, I basically just told him the details of what, of what happened that night, including okay. the, I was frozen and I couldn't stop it. And I felt like I couldn't say no, even if I could have and. And he, his response was, it's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. You have nothing to repent That's for. great. I know. Okay, so that's something bishops should do. Yes. Believe, start by believing. Tell that it's not their fault. What else did the bishop do? And then he talked about forgiveness. And Ooh, okay, talk about that. <laughs> um, so That doesn't square with it's not your fault. I know, but it's forgiving him for what he did. Forgetting forgiving the abuser yes mm. so he continued to be my home teacher and come to my house every month oh my gosh so he did so i mean he started so good <laughs> and i am so glad that he did that right because if he had tried to put it back on me i don't think my poor little self could have handled it okay so the bishop says it's not your fault but then immediately turns to wanting to protect the abuser. Mm -hmm. Did he turn in the abuser? Did he notify the authorities? Did he as far report as it I, to the police? Not that I am aware of any of it. Did he tell you to report it to the police? No, that was never crossed my mind and he never mentioned it. You made your own teacher. Or even the honor program or you know the honor code office. He remained my home teacher and I'm for as long as he still lived in the complex, which was a few more months. So I'm thinking there was nothing. So that bishop was not oriented towards, um, I, I, I want to say justice, I don't know if there's a better word, but making sure that the abuser paid the price for what he did. It was more the bishop was tuned to immediately go to to you. Now maybe he went to... The abuser. Right. I have no idea what happened there. All I know is he remained my home teacher and 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 what would you what would you have rather the bishop done? Uh removed him as my home teacher. I actually I mean, there's part of the you know, remove him from his calling it doesn't have to do anything. Now I really wish he would have said, consider going to the police or let's get you into counseling or anything. But at least he didn't tell me it was, at least he was firm. It wasn't my fault and there was nothing to repent for. So. Okay. So um, <clears throat> what's it like continuing with this, this gentleman as your home, as your home teacher? Um, <clears throat> uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and I didn't talk about it with roommates much until he started asking another roommate out. And then I told her what had happened. And then she said, he's not coming back. So um, I think she said, he's not allowed in here anymore. I think she kind of stood up for that, I, if I remember right. But he moved sh pretty sh soon after that too. So that kind of, that's kind of fuzzy. But I do remember her like, 
no, we don't let people like that in here. Like, so she had a better grasp than I did. Eric writes in one of our listeners, the church is not required to report sexual abuse or any other criminal activity to the authorities by law. Like other entities do, this has to change. And that's really interesting. Um, I think what, what state laws try and do is balance religious leaders being a safe place for someone to, you know, spiritually work out their issues and even repent and be forgiven and work through their problems and become a better person. So on the one hand, you want people to feel comfortable going to their church leaders mm -hmm. for support and healing and growth. On the other hand, uh, you know, the LDS church works very hard in Utah to make sure that the law makes it so bishops and church leaders are not mandatory reporters like a school teacher would be or, you know, someone, that, you know, in another professional setting. Right. Or even a family member, right? And so what are your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I do understand why they don't want to be mandatory reporters, but that just seems like... And I was in a, since I was 18 and an adult, I, I mean, there's nowhere I think that requires that anybody report adults. But by training, a, I mean, to me, it's like training a bishop, this is abuse, and that by protecting abusers, we're not helping them. I actually think that would be a really great step. Yeah. Okay, so how did your life proceed after this experience at BYU? Um, I became very, 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 very Mormon at that point in an effort to earn a good life and, um, got married in the temple of, I don't know, by the time I was 19, I was married in the temple. Um, how did these experiences affect your choice of a companion? Um, and how was 19 as an age to get married as a survivor of abuse? I wanted to show my family and all the people that had supported me that all the money and time they'd spent saving my life was worth it. So the next step was you get married in the temple. For them. For them. So the man I picked to marry, I, I mean, I wasn't super, I, I, he was a good guy that was nice enough, I guess, but he was willing to marry me. What, what were you thinking when you started getting emotional talking about that decision to get married? Why was that emotional to say that? Um, two reasons. I feel really sad for the 18 year old, 19 year old girl that was so lost. That's, I mean, that I really believed that that was the only way to sh make my life worth something still even, I mean, um, the other is recently having a conversation with my dad where he basically said, I'm sorry, I thought I was doing you a favor by teaching you all these things, but I, I did my best, but I was wrong. That you're not loved based on what you do. You're loved based on, I just love you. So both of those things make me emotional. Okay. So you married this guy and how did that go? Um, so from day one, and I don't know how much detail to give, but from day one, sex was, shut up, I'm almost done. I cried because it hurt. He didn't care. Um, he'd yell and scream and put pillows over my face to keep me quiet while he did what he did. And that went on for the next two years at pretty much every night. Of, and sometimes more often than once a night. And I don't know how detailed to go there, but I didn't know what marital rape was. I thought you couldn't be raped if you were married. So I thought it was just normal and I just had to learn to deal with it. So th this is obviously very uh, sensitive and hard to talk about. So 
thank you and I acknowledge that. Let's just assume that in a healthy relationship, <laughs> a, a couple says, okay, okay, now it's time for us to start having sex. We've been married. You know, are, are you ready? Does this, you know, let's try. Okay, what feels good? What doesn't feel good? What's the frequency you'd like? And it's sort of this lots of communication, lots of negotiation. And it's something where you're both seeking mutual satisfaction. Why, what was it about your history and this marriage where that didn't happen? Um, well, how did it evolve your, how did you get into this pattern? Minute one, there was, it was, it started that way from minute one. There was no communication like between us before we were married. We talked about, we went to a counselor and talked about sex and that he expected to have it in his marriage. And I said, yeah, that makes sense. And, but I didn't have, I didn't have a, being raised Mormon. I didn't have a vocabulary to talk about sex or, and I didn't understand that it was a one that, I mean, my reference point was you as women probably won't like sex. So it's your job to keep the men clean and pure which I know just went against my last, like, who am I to say no? But that was my whole reference point, that women don't like it. So you just have to do it with your husbands because it makes them happy. Uh, Todd, do you want to jump in? <laughs> <laughs> just, just one comment. That, uh, um, as an observer, one of the things to leave, that she's leaving out is the wedding night where she dissociated and that didn't stop her husband at all from, from raping her. In fact, I think it encouraged him. And I think that's important to understand what this experience was like when she says rape. Um, sometimes it's, it's more sterile, but it was, it was a violent and she had dissociated. She had when her home teacher assaulted her and that seemed to excite him. Is that from what you've told me? I, is that, that's 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 the type I, bishop. When I discovered what had happened, um, I realized that she had married a rapist. Mm. That that was my perspective. So I think that's important to understand who she was dealing with. So I have it, you know the thought comes quickly to my mind. You've experienced assault multiple times from your early from your childhood into adulthood. How does it happen that you then just Mary rapist was that just a really bad coincidence or would would the history of abuse and being a victim along with eating disorders and and the church stuff would that make you maybe more prone to be targeted by someone who um, who was also an abuser well definitely I know eating disorder made him target me because he he definitely appreciated how thin I was um, he at one point had told my mom said, I know she'll always be thin because she's had an eating disorder in the past. And, and, um, also, I mean, in any time that I had moments of, or days of relapse where then he'd tell me I looked great knowing that I wasn't doing well in my own recovery, then that's when he'd compliment me most on my appearance. So... So he was reinforcing the eating disorder. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, with that, um, how then... Uh, so, you, so he in some ways was attracted to you because of the eating disorder, which positively reinforces your eating disorder. Mm -hmm. And then from there... Uh, you're dissociating the very first night of your sexual experience as someone who had never healed from the, the PTSD or the trauma of the earlier experiences. So without, and none of this you would be able to know because you weren't able to be sexually active prior to marriage. So you're, right. so you're committing your life, not just your life, but your eternity 
to someone that you only find out after you're, you've made that commitment mm -hmm. that they're uh, an abuser. But you're locked in because it's an eternal marriage. Right. Yeah. And you don't know what your response is going to be uh, on that wedding night because you're not allowed to have sex and you haven't healed from your PTSD. So, so have, you know, it's just like so many not healing from your PTSD, being continually, you know, a victim in, in tough situations and then not allowing to have a natural courtship where you're able to sexually experiment, discover what is good or not good for you. Um, all that just perpetuates this cycle mm -hmm. of abuse. Right. And along with, I mean, because Mormon teaching is as long as you're both active and he's a good priesthood holder and you go to the temple, you can make it work. So he was willing to marry me, so therefore he's a good choice. Like, it was not... So it's possible that he targeted me. It's possible that I had no idea who I was marrying. It's possible... I mean, there's all kinds of things that... It's possible that we brought out the worst in each other that I, so, I mean, all these things are possibilities and I don't know which is, but definitely I also think that being a victim in the past and having a total lack of healthy boundaries and knowing that it's okay to say no and it's okay to take care of yourself and any of that makes, made me a good target. Right. So. So he, so you're saying on a daily basis, he would, he would rape you and you would disassociate. Is that? Is Not it? always dissociate. The, um, it's in fact, generally, I probably got to a point where it was like, I just laid there. <laughs> I just, I was there with it and fine and played my part as the person that laid there while he did his thing. And what about, um, you know, what about just having, and, and I know that this is impossible in the situation, but like, hey, you know what? I want to enjoy sex too. And this is working for me and this isn't. And let's have some different sort of pattern. And I don't like you putting pillows on my face <laughs> or, you know, I want to, I want to consent. Like, what, keep, what kept you guys from having those sorts of conversations throughout the process? I know it may sound insensitive, but no, I, we, we I need mean, people to understand how, how this environment, uh, you know, kind of uh, comes to exist, right? Um, I didn't like it. I knew that part. But I didn't know that there was a better option. So, I mean talk about it but I didn't know there was a better option so how could I even like what could I say I guess is how it I mean and I wasn't in like I wasn't interested in sex really at all with him which makes sense it was I look back at it now like the way he treated it and the way he did it like of course not but you know so how do I I didn't know how to have that conversation at all 